Welcome back. Let's start with our blood cancer immunotherapy breakout. We're joined by Dr. Han J. Cho. He's an associate professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and is an attending physician with the Multiple Myeloma Service at the Mount Sinai Tisch Cancer Institute in New York City. Dr. Cho, Brian, let's learn about what's new in immunotherapy for blood cancer. Thank you for the introduction, Tamarin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Han J. Cho. I'm here with uh, Brian Brewer from the Cancer Research Institute. Today, we're gonna be talking about uh, immune therapies for blood cancers. Um, so the original immune therapy for blood cancers, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma, uh, was allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. So this is when a donor provides bone marrow, which is then transplanted into uh, a recipient who is the uh, cancer patient. And what happens is when the bone marrow and grafts and starts to make new blood, this also makes new immune cells. And the immune cells from the graft can recognize the two cancer cells as being foreign and kill them. And so this was the first uh, demonstration of immune therapy against blood cancers, this so-called graft versus leukemia or GVL effect. And this was uh, demonstrated way back in 1979. And it's been shown to be effective in many different kinds of blood cancers, including leukemia and multiple myeloma. So we have a very strong basis uh, for understanding uh, the, uh, the ability of the immune system to control blood cancers. However, uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation is a very risky procedure. So it is uh, an intensive hospital-based procedure and there's many side effects. So the goal of immune therapies for blood cancers is to reproduce that graft versus cancer effect uh, with, a, as, with a minimum of side effects and without the, uh, the associated um, uh, risks of bone marrow transplantation. And this is largely taken the form of three strategies which are listed here. Uh, the first are targeted antibodies. Now, this actually covers a fairly broad range of uh, strategies, including quote unquote naked antibodies that are uh, uh, aimed at a target on the cancer cell and it helps the immune system recognize the cancer cells and kill them. Uh, sometimes we attach chemotherapy molecules to these antibodies, so this is like a guided missile that takes chemo directly to the tumor cells. Uh, and there's also a new strategy, which I'll talk about a little bit more, called bispecific T-cell engagers. Uh, the next category are checkpoint inhibitors. You've heard about some of these already uh, quite a bit. Um, these are gaining a lot of traction, particularly in the Hodgkin's lymphoma field. Um, there is investigation in other blood cancers, some of which uh, are too early to really report results, and others which uh, have led to um, advanced trials, and in some cases, some are not advancing. Uh, but these are antibodies that block these breaks on the immune systems called immune checkpoints, and PD-1 and PDL one are probably the most well-known. Um, and these were first approved in 2014. And then the most recent breakthrough in, uh, in blood cancers has been cell-based therapies, in particular, the so-called CAR T-cells. CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. And the first of these was approved for lymphoma in 2017. Um, the, the first CAR for multiple myeloma was just approved in 2021, a few months ago. So when we think about these strategies, um, uh, I'm going to focus on two th strategies that are directing T cells to uh, blood cancer cells. And the first of these are so-called engineered cell therapy. So this is CAR T cells and transgenic T cell receptor uh, uh, cells. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to mostly talk about CAR T cells since those are the ones that have been approved. Now, CAR engineered cellular therapy is exactly what it sounds like. We have to do some work under the hood on those T cells in order to make them effective anti-cancer agents. So what this involves is first isolating T cells from patients. So we take the large volume of blood and we isolate T cells from them. Those get sent to a laboratory where we insert receptors into the T cells so the T cell can recognize cancer cells. Then we grow those T cells so we make millions of copies so, so that they uh, we have a large force of, of cells that are, can go after the tumor, and then these ultimately get reinfused into the patient. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very uh, involved process. It requires specialized laboratories, and it requires time. 
it typically takes around three to four weeks to make the, enough T cells uh, to do this therapy. So um, sometimes patients need other types of chemotherapy between the time that their T cells are isolated and the time that they get their engineered T cells back. So how does it work? So as I said, I'm going to mostly focus on chimeric antigen receptor T cells. The way things are made is an artificial uh, receptor, the chimeric antigen receptor, is made with an extracellular region that sticks to the tumor cell. It recognizes something on the surface of the tumor cells so that the CAR T cell has this on the surface. It can find the tumor cell and stick to it. The inside of the, of the receptor has all the activation machinery necessary to turn on the T cell. So it takes the T cell to the, the tumor cell and it turns it on. Uh, the other strategy shown here is the engineered T cell receptor. This is taking a T cell receptor that, that already recognizes cancer cells. So this is typically cloned from a patient who has a good response against a certain type of tumor. And then we're inserting that receptor into uh, a patient's T cells so that they can go after uh, the cancer cells. For a variety of reasons, that's a more restrictive pathway. So the chimeric antigen receptors or CARs are much more universally available. So what happens is the cancer cells have a particular target on their surface. Those are the red triangles. And the CAR or the engineered T cell receptor recognizes those antigens. And so it brings the T cell directly to the cancer cell. And as I said, it has the activation machinery there. So it turns it on so that the cancer cells, um, that the CAR T cell can then kill the cancer cell. So bispecific anti antibodies are another strategy to bring T cells to cancer cells and turn them on. This is a slightly different strategy in which uh, we use um, the uh, sticky parts, the antigen recognizing sites from two different antibodies and put them together. So in this example, targeted antibody number one, the blue antibody, we take one of those um, red circle antigen receptor sites and then targeted antibody number two, uh, the green antibody, we take another one of those antigen receptor sites and we graft them together. So we have an artificial antibody that has two ends, one that recognizes one target, another end that recognizes another target. Now, in the case of most of the bispecific center under investigation now or approved, one end recognizes an antigen on the, on the tumor cell. The other, other side recognizes something on the T cells. It's part of the activation machinery, a molecule called CD3. So if something sticks to CD3 on a T cell, it typically is one of the on switches uh, for the T cell. So these strategies are another strategy to bring T cells to tumor cells and turn them on so that they can kill uh, the tumor cells. So that's illustrated in this example here. Again, the red triangle is the target on the surface of the cancer cells. As you can see, the blue end sticks to the target on the cancer cells. The green end sticks to CD3 on the T cells and turns them on. So then those T cells can kill the cancer cell. So these are both powerful strategies to bring T cells to tumor cells and kill them. Um, the difference with a bispecific antibody is there's, there's no engineering involved here. Um, these are off-the-shelf reagents, so patients can receive the treatment um, more or less right away, um, and it does not require three to four weeks to engineer cells and expand them and so forth. Um, but these are both effective strategies, and they're very powerful in a lot of different blood cancers. So there's actually um, uh, four CAR T cells that are listed here that have been FDA approved for them, sorry, five T cells. Four of them are for lymphoma and leukemia. One of them, which just got approved a few months ago, uh, a BECMA or IDACEL, um, was just approved for multiple myeloma. So these are the first CAR T cell for myeloma that was just approved. There are checkpoint inhibitors that are approved for, as I noted, for Hodgkin's lymphoma, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Uh, these are uh, targeting the PD-1 pathway. And uh, there are bispecific antibodies uh, approved for leukemia, that's uh, blenitumumab, uh, and there's a number of them under investigation for myeloma and lymphoma right now. So the future of immune therapy for hemolignancies, we've actually come full circle. So we started in the 70s 
with the observation that alginate bone marrow transplantation, the original immune therapy, uh, can be effective in fighting and controlling uh, blood cancers. And now we have a number of different effective strategies to reproduce this effect um, uh, safely and reproducibly uh, in the clinic. Um, so next generation strategies are to enhance and sustain that T-cell function. So we're thinking about different combinations or, or um, rationally designed combinations, not only to kick off that immune response as we're seeing with either a bispecific or a CAR T cell, but to sustain it. So can we use things like, for example, checkpoint inhibitors to keep that immune system uh, response rolling against cancers and preventing relapse of disease? Or are there different combinations of immune strategies which can increase the response rate and increase the effectiveness of these strategies? And then uh, since CAR T cells have been shown to be effective, are there ways to make them more effective? Because uh, in some cases, for example, multiple myeloma, they're very effective, but not necessarily curative. So uh, can we um, look for better targeting uh, against the cancer cells? Uh, can we make the uh, CAR T cells stronger or more effective against the tumor cells? And can we reduce this potential side effects? As you may have heard in earlier uh, discussions, uh, CAR T cells can have fairly significant side effects that require hospitalization and aggressive management. Are there ways to deliver that CAR T cell therapy as effectively, but with fewer side effects? So these are the challenges that are facing us in the blood cancer field. Um, uh, I would say that we're incredibly grateful that we've turned the corner on immune therapies. Uh, we have uh, now been able to bring these strategies into clinical use to FDA approved therapies. And the clinical trials that are ongoing now, I think, uh, hold the promise for even better immune therapies in the very near future. So thank you for your attention. I think uh, Brian's going to come and join us now, and we'll have some questions. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Cho, for that. Um, I heard a few things in your talk. Uh, we talked about cell therapies, we talked about antibody therapies, and uh, how we're on the cutting edge of technology right now, thanks to research on both of those fronts. Um, so let's just, for the people who are listening for the first time who may not understand you know, an engineered T cell, what that means, or an engineered antibody that's going after two targets, what that means. Um, let's boil it down to the, you know, I'm a blood cancer patient Let's say I have myeloma or lymphoma or something, and uh, I go and now I'm having immunotherapy explained as a potential treatment for me. Um, what's the difference between the CAR T's and the antibodies? That's a good question. Um, the way I explain it to a lot of my patients are um, your T cells, in many respects, are the soldiers that your immune system uses to fight the cancer. So, um, you have to train soldiers to recognize the enemy and kill them. So these are two different ways to train your T cells to find cancers and kill them. Uh, in, in the CAR T cell case, we're actually modifying the cell itself. So this is the first kind of uh, genetic modification um, of, a, of a cell type uh, that's been approved by the FDA. We're using um, the gene for the artificial receptor, the CAR, uh, and we're inserting that into the T cell using uh, a vector, uh, basically a way to shuttle uh, that genetic material into the T cell so that it'll make that receptor and, and have it on the surface of the cell. Um, it is, as I noted, an involved process. It requires obviously a special laboratory, special reagents and special training technicians and so forth. And it takes time. You have to grow up these cells. You make the cells, you grow them up. So it's like you're training your troops, you're putting them together and then you send them back to the clinic so that they can go into the patient uh, and, and be infused to fight the cancer cells. So that's one way to train your soldiers. The other way is with the bispecifics. So the bispecifics are kind of like, um, they're raising the flag. So the bispecific goes to the tumor cell and identifies that as a bad cell. The other end attracts and sticks to the T cells so that the T cell knows, okay, this is something bad, we're gonna kill it, okay? So it's a different method uh, but the, they both accomplish more or less the same thing. You get the T cells to recognize and kill uh, the 
tu the, the tumor cells. Uh, what, what I think is really amazing is all of this stuff sounds very simple now, right? But it took a <laughs> lot of work, right? A lot of decades of work to understand these basic mechanisms. Uh, so like before we, I move on to the next question from one of our viewers, I would love to hear from you. Like what is the role of science in advancing new cancer treatments? It's a constantly evolving process. Um, when I was a student um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, the idea of immune therapy for cancer was a pipe dream. Um, people believed that um, the immune system didn't play an important role in cancer. We now know that that's not true. Um, uh, part, of, part of the immune system's normal job, in, in addition to guarding against infections, is to constantly survey the body make sure that uh, no bad cells, cancer cells are arising. And um, so the immune system, uh, we, we learned a lot more about basic functions in the immune system in the last 40 years. Um, we've also learned how to manipulate that system. So that uh, insight, for example, you know, that came out of the Allison lab that we can block uh, an off, off signal such as PD-1 uh, was, was profound because until we got to the point where we could use, for example, antibodies or um, cytokines to uh, manipulate the immune system. Uh, we really uh, had very few options uh, in order to uh, get the immune system to kill cancer cells. And this has been uh, an ongoing journey. You know, we've, the, the first real cancer immunology probably happened in the early part of the 20th century. And, and, and it's been a, um, a long journey and science, it was absolutely necessary to understand how does the immune system work? How does it work against cancer? How can we make it work better? That's, I think, the thing that um, doesn't come you know, readily to a person who's facing a cancer diagnosis. You just want an answer, right? Um, and we know science takes time. And I think that's what's really exciting about where we are right now, right? Where we do know enough about the immune system. We don't know everything, of course, but we know enough to help some patients and there's a lot of potential to help more. You mentioned um, when you were speaking recently uh, that uh, because of the time it might take to engineer the CAR T cells, the patient might need to receive chemotherapy in the meantime. Can you say a little bit more about how these therapies work together? Yeah, so there are, a for example, the myeloma field. Um, when we take the T cells out to send them to the lab uh, to, to engineer into CAR T cells, a lot of times patients may have uh, increasing disease. It's active, it's causing a problem for the patient. So you need a, something to, uh, as a stopgap before the CAR T cells are available. And we often use chemotherapy, but we some. There's now a lot of interest into whether that chemotherapy can make the CAR T cells work better, for example. So we do know that some older style conventional chemotherapy agents actually do have some favorable flex effects on the immune system. So uh, there is now uh, some interest in doing trials using things like, for example, cytoxan as that interim chemotherapy to see if it makes um, the CAR T cell therapy work better. Uh, so there's other um, approaches um, uh, to try to improve uh, the effectiveness of these CAR T cells as well. I, I just think it's fascinating because in my role at CRI as comms director for all these years, I often hear surprise from people who understand the basic idea of mobilizing your immune system to fight cancer and really seizing on that as the answer. And I think it is, but I'm not a scientist. Uh, but I'll keep working toward it. But I do uh, hear these questions about, you know, is this replacing chemotherapy? And it sounds like that is, that's something patients have to really understand is that this is part of a multifaceted approach. Absolutely. You know, every cancer is different. And in reality, every cancer patient is different. And what we've often found, for example, in the myeloma field, you know, myeloma is a disease of plasma cells. It presents infiltrating the bone marrow. It can damage the bones, cause low blood counts, affect the kidneys. Um, so 
these are the, that's the presentation of the disease. But what we actually know now from extensive research is that not every, the, even though they all have the same sort of common manifestations, there's actually several different categories of myeloma patients. And these are defined right now by genetic changes in the cancer cells. We, there is now research into the immune system. Uh, this is a disease of the bone marrow. We're looking very intensively at immune cells and the immune microenvironment of bone marrow. You know, my lab and many others are involved in this research. And what we've discovered is there's also different categories of patients defined by the immune profile and the tumor microenvironment. So there's a lot of dynamics uh, between the tumor cells, between the immune microenvironment. Um, so every patient is different and unique. And we need to understand that biology better because some patients may work better with a CAR T cell. And some patients may have better responses with a bispecific. And some patients might do better if they get chemotherapy first and then get some sort of immune therapy. And some patients may never need chemotherapy. So that is part of the next step, the combination strategies, how to use our understanding of the biology to then tailor treatment to the individual patient. This is the called precision medicine approach. And that extends I, I, to I, immune I, therapy I, as well. I am fascinated by what you said, that sometimes a round of chemotherapy might make the following immunotherapy more effective. And um, I we can't get into all of that right now, of course, but it's interesting, again, to note that this is about combination approaches and you know you're working on two different mechanisms right so chemotherapy is attacking the cancer immunotherapy is mobilizing the immune system these are two different things that come into play together so uh, i find that interesting my next question from one of our viewers though is um, about these tests to know what markers you have you've mentioned you know you can get screened to see if you're more likely to respond to immunotherapy or not is that part of the standard of care or is that something a patient has to ask for? Uh, so that's a very good question. So the, I think the best example in blood cancers is Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there's a, uh, there's a mountain of data now that shows uh, that high pdl one expression in Hodgkin's lymphoma predicts response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So this is a standard test, you know, because if a patient who presents with Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, uh, either newly diagnosed or relapsed, has PD, uh, PDL1 expression, then you treat them with checkpoint inhibitors, and there's a very high response rate, over 70%. So that's like standard for Hodgkin's lymphoma now. In the myeloma space, we don't have a similar uh, so called marker for uh, checkpoint inhibitors, for example, uh, but there's a lot of interest in the expression of certain targets for immune therapy on myeloma cells. So um, many of the CAR T, most of the CAR T cells that are under investigation now in myeloma target something called BCMA. And there's other bispecifics and, and that um, target BCMA and also two other targets, uh, GPRC5D and FCRH5. So now when we're seeing new or relapsed patients in myeloma, at least in our clinic, we are asking our pathology department to look for expression of BCMA and GPRC5D. This isn't standard yet, but as these agents get approved by the FDA, my suspicion is that that's going to become part of the regular workup uh, for myeloma as well. So um, our uh, our screening is going to be guided by the science. You know, like uh, the Hodgkin's lymphoma finding with PDL1 was very important, and this grew out of clinical trials, um, and so that now informs regular clinical practice. And I think, and similarly. Uh, what we're learning about other types of immune therapies, for example, in myeloma, uh, that that's going to affect how we assess each patient as they come in. Well, Mount Sinai is obviously on the cutting edge, right, of the science around immunotherapy. You're one of the best treatment centers in the country. What about someone who's not, you know, can can travel, you know, to New York City or to one of the other excellent centers in the country? Um, is this something that someone should ask their doctor just to say, you know, are you testing me for these three biomarkers? I, I, I would actually phrase it a little bit differently. So if you're a myeloma patient and you don't live near a major metropolitan center or one of the big uh, myeloma centers, 
um, you can still benefit from a consultation with one of these institutions. Okay, uh, I always encourage um, myeloma patients, wherever they are, if it is at all possible, for them to see a myeloma specialist, even if it's just um, as a consultation, because this is something we do, for example. I have patients um, from as far away as like Florida and uh, Maine and Vermont, even though we're based in New York. And if I see them once or twice in New York, I, I will often collaborate with a local physician, you know, wherever the patient might live to help manage their disease, okay? So obviously we can't do clinical trials like that, but we can deliver standard therapies um, uh, to patients uh, in the community. And now that things like CAR T cells and bispecifics are gonna be approved for myeloma, uh, we're gonna collaborate with our uh, uh, colleagues who uh, live in the community uh, in order to deliver this kind of care effectively and safely to myeloma patients everywhere. I think, um, I think that's amazing advice. I actually didn't know that. I could just log in and get a consultation at one of the top cancer centers around the country, even though I don't live next to them. Uh, that's well, a amazing. lot of them will do this. They're, they're, you know, we're living in an era where we're discovering all sorts of capabilities about uh, remote work, <laughs> and that that includes medicine. Um, typically, what I would advise people to the initial consultation is best done in person. So even if it's a two or three hour drive, that first visit, it's worthwhile to do it in person, and then maybe subsequent to that, it can be remote. Um, but uh, uh, instead of having to go there every week, if you just have to go there once, it's much less of a burden, right? I think that's really practical advice. You know, that's one of the top questions that we often find in our summit series, you know, if you don't live next door, but it sounds good that, you know, you want to get that initial in-person consultation and then the rest could be more manageable, you know, in the age of COVID, I guess. Um, so I have another question from our audience here, um, it, it involves age, um, difference between adolescents and adults and responses to immunotherapy. Do you see any, any correlation around age or is this not something that really uh, needs to come top of mind when you know, a new patient, maybe an adolescent, is facing one of these blood cancers? That's a good question. Um, and it's one that we typically don't face in myeloma because myeloma is a disease of aging. <laughs> so uh, the majority of myeloma patients are, are uh, diagnosed in their 50s or later. Uh, there are rare cases of adolescent and young adult myeloma, but it's pretty rare. Um, and this is a different story for lymphomas and leukemias. There is uh, sort of uh, two peaks in the distribution of these diseases at a gross generalization. There's a, there's a young peak and then there's the older peak. So I think that the question is not so much about effectiveness, but I think about tolerability because um, immune therapy is very powerful. Uh, in many cases, they're very safe, but you have to recognize that when you're manipulating the immune system, it can be very uh, have very profound effects. So uh, the two that we're most concerned about in things like, for example, CAR T cell therapy, is what is called cytokine release syndrome, um, which can happen within uh, hours of getting that CAR T infusion. And this is uh, basically an overactivation of the immune system where patients develop high fevers, um, uh, they can develop um, uh, low blood pressure, and all the signs of a, of a very bad infection. And sometimes this requires ICU level care to support. Um, so this is now the hospitalization after the CAR T infusion has become a standard practice, uh, at least uh, for the currently approved CAR Ts. So the question I think is, is not that we're not going to see less effective treatment or more effective based on age, but whether uh, patients can tolerate those treatments and, and um, have uh, uh, repercussions from the side effects of those treatments. So at a gross, at a very uh, general level, young patients tolerate those types of rigors much better than older patients, and it's true. So that does figure into the equation when you're considering what types of, any type of therapy for cancer, and certainly for immune therapies, that should be a consideration. I think we heard Dr. O'Dunsey say, um, or it might've been Dr. Puree, I don't recall, uh, say that, uh, you know, 
predicting a patient response to immunotherapy is often tied to the general health of the patient, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, that's good to know and, and, and good, you know, things to think about. Um, another question we have coming in from our viewers is around, um, uh, how do I say this? Uh, when your immune system is compromised, uh, they have seen, this particular viewer has seen a number of clinical trials have that as an excluding factor. So perhaps you have HIV or perhaps you are already, you know, immunocompromised from receiving some other form of treatment. Um, it's a big question that we get a lot, you know, around how effective can immunotherapy be for patients who might fall into that category? And then what recourse do they have for enrolling in trials? Yeah, that's a good question. Obviously for immune therapy clinical trials, um, you want to have healthy uh, immune cells to fight the cancer. And unfortunately, you know, uh, for a clinical trial, you want to increase the probability of success. So you want to minimize variables such as immune suppression from drugs or from underlying illness and so forth. Um, I think it's important to consider then how can we make people who have immune compromise healthy enough to then benefit from immune therapies? That's the question. And you know, there's certainly uh, strategies that are under investigation uh, to do this. Um, but uh, once a, a agent is approved, for example, um, uh, a bispecific or CAR T cell is approved, um, that gives uh, the option to do whatever um, a clinician feels is necessary to improve the front end, you know, improve the immune system. So if a patient needs treatment for an immunosuppressive infection, or if you need to change treatments to remove immunosuppressive drugs prior to starting that immune therapy. I think that um, is an option that remains available. And this is, as always, a collaboration between patients and their treating physicians. So there should be discussions about these uh, questions. And you know, hopefully we'll be seeing immune therapy clinical trials in the near future to try to address these issues more formally. Uh, I think you've underscored that point very well uh, during the discussion, Dr. Cho. Uh, that every patient is unique and every patient's treatment decisions, uh, you know, are unique. And that's, that's part of a discussion with uh, the, the treatment uh, team. So thank you for saying that. I'll just, we, we're out of time, but I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, in, in your time in the field, how do you perceive the advances that we're seeing in, in treatment with immunotherapy? And where do you think we're, it's going to lead? Well, we've, the last 10 years has been the story of big steps, right? We've had approvals for the first vaccines and then checkpoint inhibitors and cellular therapies and bispecifics. So we're seeing big steps uh, in, in new technologies and new strategies for treatment. I think the next big step is understanding how to put them together and how to, to give the right treatments to the right patients. And I think ultimately that is a road uh, to curative therapy for many of these diseases. Certainly that's how we're operating in myeloma. And, and I have hope for my patients now because when I started treating this disease in the, in the late 90s, uh, the median survival was about three years and we only had conventional chemotherapy. And now over the last 20 years, median survival has improved uh, several fold. And um, for the patients who are diagnosed today, there's, I think, real optimism that they're going to benefit from curative therapy. So uh, I'm optimistic and hopeful. There's a lot of hard work that still needs to be done, uh, but I think we've made a lot of progress and, and we just need to keep going. Well, I, w I wish we can get it into more about, you know, how much your clinical practice intersects with your research, uh, but we can't do that here. Uh, but I do know that it is a lot of work and kudos to you for doing this and kudos to all the cancer researchers out there who are you know, testing these therapies and learning as much as we can from treating patients. So with that, um, we're gonna have to conclude our myeloma session and blood cancer session. So Dr. Huncho, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, let's move on to the next breakout. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me.